Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, September 23rd, 2021 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. I'm Mayor David Narkowitz, the chair of the committee. This meeting is being held as an online Zoom meeting um, pursuant to uh, COVID-19 modifications to the uh, state's open meeting law. Um, I would ask folks who are joining us this evening to um, please uh, mute yourself until such time that there is uh, um, opportunities to unmute. Um, and I will ask the clerk to call the roll of the school committee. I'll start with Member Voss. Present. Member Gold. I see you, but don't hear you, Member Here, Gold. here, here. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, here. Mayor Narkowitz. Present. Member Busanski. Present. Member Fallon. I do not see Member Fallon tonight yet. Um, Member Serafi Cox. Present. Member Condon. Present. Member Levy. Present. Member Kaufman is also not here, I don't think. Uh, and Member Goldman. I read your list. Present. Okay. Your Honor, you have a quorum. Okay, thank you very much. So um, this is one of the meetings that the school committee um, sets aside uh, throughout the course of the year um, to focus on student achievement. And uh, it's an opportunity for us to really focus in and hear um, from the superintendent and the administration about uh, different aspects of that and how we're doing as a district. Um, so this evening, um, we will be our, our, our loan um, order of business in uh, in open session is a report from Dr. Provost on the 2021 um, MCAS results. Um, there were two items that were had been added as a late minute addition as new business, but they're actually uh, not needed. So, um, so those items actually a and B, um, we do not need to take up on an emergency basis. So we'll move right to C and the 2021 MCAS report and Dr. Prevost. Thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen at this time. And thank you everyone for your attention to this report. I will admit that unlike prior year's reports, I'm presenting this one um, somewhat with an, an, an ambivalence uh, hovering over the whole thing. Um, last year, there were so many factors at play and there were there was the timing of the MCAS, which I will get into later, I think was really problematic. And so, you know, I would say this is probably the first time in my whole career as an educator, certainly my career as a superintendent, where I feel somewhat awkward that I have to give an MCAS report. Um, so before I do that, I'm going to um, discuss, sorry, I'm gonna to change to present mode. Before I get into the numbers, I wanna discuss several caveats, which I think are important for everyone to bear in mind. Um, so you'll note that we have new information about student performance, but we don't have new information about school accountability ratings. That's because on June 22nd, I think in part as a nod to everything that was going on and some of the ambivalence that I just referenced, the Board of Elementary and Secondary Educated Education voted to amend their regulations and refrain from issuing district and school accountability results for this year. Um, so this, this batch of information is really meant to be used only for diagnostic purposes, not for school or district accountability. It won't impact our school or district accountability. And then to say the least, we had a lot in flux last year, including the testing calendar, which was rev revised several times because many schools were still closed when some of the MCAS tests were first scheduled to be administered. We also had shortened versions of some of the tests. And it seemed to me that the timing was especially unfortunate for middle school students. I was in the 
you know, making the plea uh, to all parts of the community about how important it was to reopen our schools and restart in person learning because students needed time to be with their peers and the way the testing schedule fell. We, we had middle school students faced with an MCAS test almost immediately upon starting in person learning and I think that had um, a large impact on the next bullet point, which is the uh, presence of an opt out movement in the district. Um, JFK was, was particularly impacted by opt outs as a guide. Desi advises that the reliability of school level information is compromised if fewer than 80% of students in a school participate. We had greater than 80% participation at Bridge Street and Jackson Street and greater than 90% participation at Leeds, Ryan Road and the high school. So I think the results for those five schools are reliable. However, the participation rate for the middle school was 68%. So we should really take everything I'm going to talk about tonight concerning the middle school um, on, with a grain of salt uh, because it did the opt out was to such an extent it didn't meet the threshold that the state um, recommends for reliability. I would also point out that this report was created using preliminary data in order to meet the deadline to provide documents to the school committee. In preparation for this presentation I checked for any serious discrepancies between the preliminary and the final results, and I have not found any. However, members of the public might find the final results that are reported on the website now off by a percent or two. That's because this report was created using preliminary data rather than the final data. And just to explain the difference of what those two things are, there are always some students in the final analysis that are reported to more than one district. And so there has to be a final reconciling of data to make sure that students are reported to one and only one district, one and only one school. And in that process, there's some shifting of um, some slight shifting of, of data from the preliminary to the final results. It's also important to remember that we had fewer instructional days due to the reduction of structured learning time from 180 to 170 days and the O day schedule that was uh, in place for most of the year. Finally, and most importantly, we intentionally prioritized relationship building over content coverage last year. In fact, this, this committee encouraged the state legislature to consider postponing the test administration given the special circumstances we faced last year. Uh, unfortunately, even if it wanted to, the state legislature could not provide any relief because the federal government did not offer a waiver option as it had in the first year of the pandemic. So I would just ask everyone to bear those caveats in, in mind as we move forward. So first we're going to talk about differential impacts on different academic disciplines. As our internal testing showed, language arts performance in the upper elementary grades did not suffer and even improved. In grade three, our performance relative to pre-COVID levels and relative to the state improved rather dramatically. In 2018 and 2019, our third graders performed below the state average. Last year's performance would put them at about the 57th percentile relative to other districts in the state and higher than their own performance in prior years. We did show a little bit of a dip in fourth grade, but we remained above the statewide average. In grade 10, we showed improvements from pre-COVID achievement levels and the performance gains were seen in all student subgroups. Students with disabilities, non-disabled students, economically disadvantaged students, non-economically disadvantaged students, high needs students, non-high needs students, Hispanic or Latino students, multiracial students, and white students all exceeded the statewide average for their subgroups in ELA in the 10th grade. There is almost no change at all in our fifth grade science and technology achievement where our performance remained above the statewide average. We saw a large uptick in our eighth grade science and technology achievement. However, as a reminder, the participation rate was only 64%. So this result should be viewed with caution. The high school science tests are the so-called 
uh, they're the last of the so-called legacy MCAS tests, and that's why this graph looks a little different and why the reporting categories are named differently. Uh, we showed some backtracking in biology. However, it's important to note that this result uh, represents only 80 students who are involved in the spring administration because more than half of this, the um, student group took the test in the fall. So again, this is not necessarily something I would consider reliable. One of the most salient conclusions coming out of achievement testing at the local, state, and national level is that COVID-19 related learning impacts fell most heavily in the area of mathematics. In Massachusetts, the group of students meeting or exceeding expectations fell from 13 to 17% across grades three through eight and by 7% in grade 10. And we saw comparable declines in math achievement in our district. So next I'll take a look at impacts by age and grade. These charts depict the annual comparisons by grade band corresponding to elementary, middle, and high school. In both English language arts and mathematics, we saw the largest negative impacts at the mid, mid, middle school. However, I would remind everyone once again, the reliability of the middle school scores is questionable due to the low participation rates. So this, um, this result should not be overinterpreted. I think it's important to take a moment to celebrate the achievements of our elementary schools and Bridge Street and Leeds in particular. And I saw, I saw Beth and I saw Liz and I saw some other Bridge Street staff on the, on the um, call before I started this presentation. So I'm really speaking particular to you. I know this has been a long time coming. And I know when I came to the district both Bridge Street and Leeds were in what was then called level three status, which is the designation reserved for the lowest performing 20% of schools or subgroups in the state. Well, they're not in the bottom 20% anymore. In fact, they're in the top half of schools in the state for ELA achievement. I originally thought getting Bridge Street School and Leeds out of status as an absolutely mission critical goal. Now that the specter of state intervention is no longer hanging over either school, we've turned in the new DIP to metrics for equity and trying to in increase equity of achievement before, between the schools. And as you can see from both the line graph and the bubble chart, all four elementary schools are now performing within a much narrower band on both achievement and growth. In other words, there's greater equity of achievement at our four elementary schools. ELA achievement, at, ELA achievement at the high school continues to outpace the state. Here you see the decline in mathematics achievement I pointed to earlier. And you can see that our declines mirrored the losses seen across the state. There was a similar narrowing of achievement gaps between our four elementary schools with Bridge Street, Ryan Road and Leeds now within a 5% band of students meeting or exceeding expectations in math. However, in this case, they're clustered below the statewide average instead of above it. There's also a large spread in growth rates looking at the chart on the right. And so it will be important to close those gaps in growth rates and also move the overall achievement up. Math achievement at the high school declined, but remained above the statewide average, which also declined. Now I'll talk about impacts by student group. Both students with disabilities and non-disabled students made ELA gains in the elementary grades and in the high school. As an example, I've shared the disaggregated results for grade three here. For your information, Students with disabilities in Northampton met or exceeded expectations on the third grade ELA assessment at nearly one and a half times the rate of the statewide subgroup. And non-disabled students met or exceeded expectations at nearly 1.2 times the rate for the statewide subgroup. Superintendent, Oops, we're not- Sorry, seeing... sorry, I was on the wrong. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you for that. 
So this is the chart I was just talking about. <clears throat> uh, likewise, in grade 10, both students with disabilities and non-disabled students made progress. Both students at the middle school, we saw performance declines for both students with disabilities and non-disabled students. Remember the results are not reliable because of the low participation rate. Participation rate. Um, it can be difficult to interpret the directionality of a four level variable where all four levels are changing. So for these, I've also included the CPI. Um, the CPI is a scale transformation that is applied to each individual test result and can be averaged to give you a sense of the tendency of the whole group of scores. You can see here that the CPI for both groups declined from 2019 to 2021, in, in, indicating decreased performance. And I can also tell you that the CPIs for both groups fell below the CPIs for their statewide subgroups at grade eight. We saw similar things in grade six and grade seven. I just am sharing this as an example of what we saw for students with disabilities and non-disabled students at the middle school. Uh, we, we saw in mathematics, we saw declines for both disabled and non-disabled students across the entire grade three to eight continuum. However, our students with disabilities did make notable gains at the high school level where they met or exceeded expectations at almost twice the statewide average for the subgroup. There was a slight decline in the performance for non-disabled students, as you can see, um, but really pleased to see the strong improvement gains that students with disabilities were able to make on the grade 10 test, which is the only high stakes test in the midst of a pandemic. So, that, that was a really amazing result. The lowest performance category on the next generation and MCAS is called not meeting expectations. And while there wasn't much change in the number of non-economically disadvantaged students not meeting expectations, the proportion of economically disadvantaged students not meet meeting expectations in grades three through eight increased from about a quarter of the group to more than a third. So that's the red bar in the chart on the left. And the economically disadvantaged group is the group on the left. So you can see that red bar growing for them in ways we didn't see the red bar growing for non-economically disadvantaged students. At the high school, we saw shifts at the other end of the spectrum with the percentage of non-economically disadvantaged students who exceeded expectations increasing markedly, while the percentage of economically disadvantaged students exceeding expectations shrank slightly. So we didn't see that same um, concern about increasing numbers of economically disadvantaged students not meeting expectations, but we did see that the non-economically disadvantaged students were really pushing into the top two levels of performance in ways that our economically disadvantaged students did not. Here you can see that while both economically and non-economically disadvantaged students lost ground in terms of math achievement, the economically disadvantaged student group was especially hard hit in grades three through eight. And again, you can look at that red bar or, or look at the absence of um, economically disadvantaged students in the blue or the red. One way of looking at that is, you know, after this COVID impact, only 7% of economically disadvantaged students in the entire grade span from three through eight were meeting or exceeding expectations in mathematics. At the high school, losses were similar for both groups. You know, the four bars were moving around quite a bit. So I, I put on, I added the CPI for these. And so you can see the CPI dip is comparable for both groups. English learners were also disproportionately impacted, both in ELA and in math. And I would point to the not meeting expectations category, that red bar, and see how different it is after COVID as opposed to pre-COVID. 
So next I'm gonna talk about performance of different racial and ethnic subgroups. But before I do that, I do wanna just um, explain that I'm gonna be using the reporting categories as named and designated by DESI because that's the only option. Um, I will note that many consider the term Hispanic to be problematic because it emphasizes a Eurocentric colonial history, obscures complex racial and ethnic identities and excludes indigenous and black identities. I don't mean, uh, I don't mean to be perpetrating a microaggression. I, I don't mean to be offending anyone. I just am using the, the terminology as Desi uses it. And even if that, um, even if that is not an opinion you share, I'll say that we obviously always had an issue of a compressing and losing of identities um, in this group. The, the chart on the right-hand side is from the SIMS handbook. This is the, the many hundred page um, manual that we have to use to provide codes for every student. And this is the race ethnicity coding. And so you can see there are 63 different racial or ethnic codes. And there are 30 of them that all, the second, that second column, numbers 33 through 63, that all get compressed into this single category called Hispanic or Latino. So there's a number of identities that we um, ask individuals to, to name, but then when it comes to creating categories, the state says they're all one category. So that in and of itself is problematic. With that said, um, I would say that in grades three through eight, we saw similar performance declines in ELA for students of all racial and ethnic subgroups. At the high school, we saw the opposite. We saw performance gains for both Hispan uh, Hispanic or Latino students and white students. The Hispanic or Latino subgroup showed greater gains, thereby increasing equity the outcome equity of this measure of achievement, or another way of saying that is by reducing um, inequities. Just to explain where all the other racial and ethnic subgroups went, the previous slide showed the combined results from six tested grades. This shows just one grade. It takes 10 or more students to form a subgroup. When the six grades are combined, there are enough students to form subgroups in each of the racial and ethnic groups shown on the slide. In grade 10, there are only enough students to form subgroups for Hispanic or Latino, white, and multiracial students, but that was only in 2021, which is why the multiracial um, group appears just as a dot. There was a subgroup in 2021 and not enough students for a subgroup in 2019. Students of all racial and ethnic groups showed declines in mathematics in grades three through eight. And in grade 10. And with that, I, I would just conclude with a few takeaways. Um, in examining this information over the past several months, the lessons I take from it are that keeping schools open is essential. Um, there were impacts that really cut against the grain of everything we're trying to do and have been trying to do in a in terms of increase in equity for our students. Um, in, in that one year, we saw reversals that wiped out um, gains that we had been making over time in the previous several years. So whatever else happens this year, the most pro-equity thing we can do is keep our schools open. Next, we have things to celebrate. Improved ELA achievement at Bridge Street and Leeds which both showed their strongest performance ever. Improved science and technology engineering performance at JFK, which also had a new personal best. Improved ELA achievement for students with disabilities at the elementary and high school. I would also include students without disabilities, the elementary and high school. And improved ELA achievement and greater equity of achievement at the high school. Um, so, to think that we were able to do that in spite of everything that COVID threw at us last year, I think is, is grounds for major celebration. 
especially since most of those were in schools that had 80 or 90% of students participating. So we know those were reliable results. Next, nearly all students would benefit from acceleration in mathematics. It's the area we're trying to hit the hardest in our acceleration efforts this year. And um, middle school students, especially seventh grade, were heavily impacted by COVID. Now, I, I've said that th we have to take the MCAS results with a grain of salt, and that's true. But if you recall, our own internal testing showed that, that middle school students, especially last year's sixth grade, which is this year's seventh grade, um, I remember saying this is the only group where we're seeing signs of regression. So that is a, is a strong takeaway. Um, and finally, economically disadvantaged students, which are 27.4% of our student population, and English learners were disproportionately impacted. And so with that, I'll stop my share and turn it over to the committee. Thank you, Dr. Provost. Um, so are there questions? Are there um, discussion? Um, do you want to raise hands? Uh, I can recognize people who have any questions about the slides. Oh, sorry, Member Voss. Oh, I have I, a couple questions. Um, I'll just, that's okay. I'll ask um, two of them right now. Um, thank you. That was. Um, a lot of information and thanks for your presentation, Dr. Provost. Um, the first question is the I don't remember what CPI stands for, but I remember it's some sort of numerical, um, you know, score on these tests. And I'm just wondering if you could, if you have a sense of what the standard deviation might be in some of those averages and how much overlap there is. And I keep feeling like we suggest adding things like a standard deviation, and I'm just hoping at some point we could, but maybe it's not possible to. Um, so I guess when we see a difference of five, does that is that significant? I can I don't know what the standard deviations of those measures for our district are. I can tell you that they they tend to be very stable at the statewide level and. Um, a change of one or two points represents a significant improvement or decline. Um, I can tell you that when we were prior to COVID working on our improvement targets, which were set by the state for our proficiency ratings, our accountability ratings, in most cases, they were looking to move those numbers between 0.8 and 1.2% per year, which represented probably the middle group of achievement gains seen within the state. So a small change okay. means a lot on those. Thank you. That's, <clears throat> excuse me, that's really helpful. And then my other question is, um, I agree there were some bright spots in what you presented. And um, the one thing I want to ask about is why do you think our math scores decreased? And what do you think long-term um, we are going to do about it? So the first thing I would say is we're seeing the same thing that, that is happening across the state and across the nation. Um, this, I haven't seen a definitive explanation of why math was impacted differently than ELA. I can just say as an educator that, I, that task predicts um, performance and that I think we were able to maintain a lot of the same kinds of tasks remotely that we would be doing in person for English language arts. I think it was much harder in a remote environment to provide the same kind of ta tasks that we would do in a classroom. For example, um, having students use manipulatives and having the, the teacher right there to observe how the student is using the manipulatives and what type of thinking errors that might indicate and in redirecting them. Um, I just think that is was probably not able to be done um, nearly as effectively in remote learning as it, as it could have been done in person. Thanks. Um, I'll just 
Member Levy. Thanks. I'll echo my gratitude, Dr. Provost, for your time and energy and, and the clarity of the presentation. This I don't know if there's a way for you to know the answer to this, but I'm just curious. Do you know the demographics of the students who opted out of the of the MCAS? Um, I'm thinking especially in terms of students with disabilities versus not, but other demographics as well. I haven't seen an opt out report. I suppose I could do it algebraically by sort of finding the missing students. Um, I, I can tell you that I did look to see if, you know, there was a any pattern that I could just, you know, jump out at me. Um, and really, the only pattern I saw was that it was middle school students, you know, it seemed to be from all across the board, it didn't seem to be hitting any one group of middle school students more so than others. Okay, thanks. Member Gold. Uh, thanks, yeah, thanks for the presentation. Um, and I'll share, the, I think it's great that accountability ratings are being postponed or what have you this year um, and uh, gives that flexibility to schools. And so something I know that we're doing and maybe you guys already have it on the horizon, but um, we've started digging into the item analysis and the standards and kind of just having teachers look at the actual question and say, listen, like based on what you did during the Zoom year, what was it, what would be your expectations on this question? On some of those teachers have been like, yeah, you know what, we weren't able to cover that or um, it was too complex to teach on Zoom. And some of the questions teachers are like, yeah, you know what, we really dug into this standard in this question. And so there is how we're seeing the value and saying, okay, how did our kids perform on that? Um, and then either, you know, celebrating that or reconsidering what strategies we were using. So um, you do doing it school by, you know, class, even teacher by teacher to that level, if at all possible, I think is a way to leverage this data. Thank you. Thank you, Member Gold. Uh, Member Serafie Cox. So uh, as uh, as you may have noticed, I have a mini me on screen this evening, and she actually has a question for the superintendent. Uh, would you like to ask it or would you like me to ask it? Okay. Uh, she would like to know why we do the MCAS. And I have a feeling that the reason she's asking is because her experience with MCAS last year was very difficult. Um, she didn't finish either of the writing or the math, or sorry, the ELA or the math, and, um, and spent like all day doing it um, and had a teacher sitting there next to her, like redirecting her. It was, it was a very, very difficult experience. Um, and so I think I, I'm also kind of interested in this question in terms of the broader question of um, this is potentially a really difficult, like it's, it's something that changes the way that our teachers both approach learning as well as uh, the experience that, that uh, our students have. Um, she still talks about MCAS and how difficult that was that day or those two days. Um, so I'm, I think I'm also wondering like what effect in total does MCAS have on, uh, on our ability to deliver high quality education um, and, and how do we weigh those, um, those positive effects that we can, you know, look at these graphs and, and see some some disparate impacts potentially and, and be able to target things at the same time as uh, some, some potential uh, negative impacts that are affecting our teachers and our students. Okay, so I will try to answer um, age appropriately for both questioners here. Um, so, <laughs> so the first thing I would say is that I really don't want students to stress about MCAS. Um, it is, it's one, it's one measure that certainly can't be a reflection of everything you've learned in school. Um, it's, it's like when you go to the, the doctor and they take your temperature, it says something about your health at that moment, but it's far from the full picture. So, um, 
that's what I would I would say. Really, I, I would hope that you, as you face this again and again in your in your career, don't don't worry too much about it. Do the best you can, but it's not going to affect um, it's not going to affect the way in which we present instructions in the school. Because I've always said, and I know that you know teachers on this in this district are strongly committed to not teaching to the test, but just covering standards and hoping that the test is well enough aligned to the standards that kids will do okay on it. Um, and so that's really our, our philosophy around that. Um, in terms of why we have to do it, now I'll give sort of a more adult answer, which will both be, first I'll give the uh, disappointing one and I'll give a better one. Um, we do it because it's the law. Um, there's a state law and a federal law, which both mandate um, testing for students in public schools. So we have to do that. Um, but really what I see the benefit is, is not any of the charts that I showed tonight. I think the benefit is on the individual student level because what we're able to do is identify students who need help and um, try to get some resources to them. We do a lot of testing for that. We have our own district tests that pick up a lot of kids and a lot of the kids that we identify are the same ones who are identified by the MCAS, but it's a different test and it shows us sometimes kids who are struggling in a different way. Um, so I think, you know, we're doing at your school, lift off learning right now. Most of the students in lift off learning were identified through our AIMS web testing, but there's a group that were only identified through MCAS. And so because we have that test, we're able to um, get more help to more kids. And then the other thing I would say is it really, the accountability has been a good driver of equity. And I'll, this is more of an adult answer. Um, it, it's interesting how things have kind of, kind of changed in recent years, but at the beginning, statewide testing and participation for all students was seen as an important civil rights issue. Um, and I can tell you why that is. I remember a time when special education classrooms were frequently in the basement of schools and they were often using books that were being, you know, discarded by general ed classroom teachers and parents and advocates for students with disabilities felt that it was important for them to be counted in the system so that schools paid sufficient attention to making those students achieve as well as they could too. And the same is true for um, students of all um, historically and currently marginalized groups. Okay, thank you. Um, Member Bisansky, you have your hand up next. Thanks. Um, I guess I'm curious, you kind of touched on this a little bit in your presentation. I also like, would like to thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm just curious how this, um, these uh, MCAS scores aligned with or didn't with our own assessments, our own internal assessments, if you have a... Yeah. I think uh, in ELA, they lined up really well. Uh, in math, in reality, they, there, were, there was a lot of congruence as well. That sixth grade group that we identified through AIMSWeb also showed up um, strongly as having um, performance concerns for math. The one thing I would say is, um, in general, students did worse in math on MCAS than they did on our own internal testing. And that's another reason to get back to the answer I just gave why I think it's an important assessment it measures some different things and it measures some things in a different way. And it allowed us to pick up some kids for intervention that we hadn't identified through our own internal testing. Got it. Okay, thank you. And then I was also curious about, um, I guess it's on the last slide um, where you say nearly all students would benefit from acceleration in mathematics. And you said, we're hitting that hard this year and, and what that looks like, what does that mean? So, at the last meeting, you approved an additional uh, math interventionist at the middle school. So we have three there now. We have liftoff learning going with more than 200 students. Um, we're bringing in uh, Advantage Math Recovery to help staff that program, which are the trainers of our teachers. So um, we are trying to 
bring in as mobilize as much math um, resource as we can this year to try to close gaps as quickly as we can. But I do think it will take some time. And as I said earlier, this will be a multi-year process. For some kids, it'll be a one-year process, but for some kids, it'll be a two or three-year process to get back to where they need to be. And um, and what it, what does that look like at the high school? How are you supporting math? So at the high school, we really didn't see, you know, I mean, we saw declines, but it, it wasn't dramatic. Um, we did have some credit recovery classes over the, the summer. We did have, um, and it we did have a uh, pre, calculus class over the summer because that was one of the sessions that had been missed but um that and we have added um personnel at the middle school we did that through the budget but uh, other than that um we haven't made as strong of a investment there because we haven't seen as, as significant of a performance decline so i uh, so when you so you're sort of saying we're when you say nearly all students you're kind of looking at that vertically from k through 12 you're not looking at that horizontally from, um, or are you from more challenged learners to more advanced learners? I would say both. You know, I would say if you've been a student who's lived through the pandemic, chances are you could use some help in math. Okay. But it's, you know, hits different groups differently. It's the economically disadvantaged students much harder than non-economically disadvantaged students. Hits ELs extremely hard. And in our district seems to hit middle school students very hard as well. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Member Levy. Thanks. I, you, you mentioned something that sparked a question for me, uh, the notion that some of the students put into the liftoff learning program or who have access to that program were identified solely through MCAS. Um, I was I was uh, talking with a friend of mine who received a letter saying that her kid had been identified as uh, needing extra help in math uh, with no explanation of like how this kid was identified or what the issues were, just that this kid was being invited to lift off learning. And um, my friend was a little taken aback because this was the very first communication she had ever received about her kid potentially needing extra help in the subject. There was no communication from teachers before. There was no indication that this was an issue. Um, and uh, when she asked the principal what's going on, I've never heard of, from you and my kid is a pretty excited learner and usually pretty engaged and, and does pretty well. And the principal said, oh yeah, well this kid you know, answered like eight out of 30 questions right in the math section of MCAS. So it was identified. Meanwhile, this kid was a third grader, so taking MCAS for the very first time. And it just, um, it raised for me some questions about who is doing the liftoff learning. Number one, are they kids who need to be there necessarily? But, but especially my question is, what checks and balances do we have when we're using MCAS, which we know has racial and it's it's there's got there's racism and inequity embedded in MCAS and and standardized tests, uh, and so what what checking was done and is being done um, to ensure that we're not identifying students for this program in problematic ways. And then what communication are we doing and are we using to gently let folks know uh, what's happening and why? Um, I'm curious to both those, those questions about the communication, but also the checking and balancing. So in our uh, tiered intervention program per se, we have a strong component of professional judgment. And we say, you have to consider all of the data on the student but that data includes the data that you have as a teacher. Um, and that's how normally we're identifying students for tier two interventions. This year with liftoff, you know, the scope of it was kind of overwhelming. And so we weren't able to do that same kind of process that we normally do. Um, when we're in sort of the more normalized situation, the place where we use MCAS scores primarily to identify students for tier two intervention is the middle school. 
Um, and there we have uh, basically a child study team that sits down and looks at the students um, to make sure that, that they're good candidates. Um, the, other, the other thing is I would agree there, you know, is no assessment that doesn't have some uh, bias embedded in it. And that's why we try to use multiple forms of assessment. That's why we try to um, include professional judgment of educators, but that also has bias embedded in it. But you know what we normally try to do is look up for, for multiple indicators pointing in the same direction. But you know we were kind of taken aback with what we saw with math. And so we sort of um, took the approach of possibly having some false positives in the group um, rather than missing kids who might need help. Yeah, I hear that. And I, and I, and I do, I do think sort of theoretically that's a good approach, right? Like let's give the most help we can. I guess I'm just thinking about the potential for stigma, especially for a kid who holds a historically marginalized identity, who's told you're being identified as needing extra help. Um, when that may not actually be the case. And, you know, I'll, to be honest, this kid who I'm talking about is like ecstatic to be in the program because this kid loves math. And it's like, I get to do extra, like, like told their mom, like, I can't wait to go to school tomorrow. I get to do lift off learning and do all these math games. But it's like, this kid doesn't need it. And I'm just wondering, you know, great to have kids in there who are engaged and excited to do more math and, you know, what's the message that we are sending and are we doing it in a gentle way? And it doesn't sound like at least this year it was done in a gentle way. And I have concerns about that. Thank you. Member Gold. Um, well, this being our first round of um, MCAS on school committee as a member, um, I am I'm wondering, um, do you normally share the targets that the state sets for the schools when they are released? Like, is that something that's publicly shared um, so that we have, you know, because with the accountability being a big piece of the district improvement plan, um, knowing and how that's related to the targets, um, I feel like that could be something informative. But if it's not something traditionally shared, either A, is it something you consider or B, why is it not shared? Normally, I do both the achievement results and the accountability results that are based on the achievement. Um, and that's where I have the discussion of targets, because as you know, the accountability system is based on how close you came to the targets that were set in, for each of the groups. Um, this year, we had no target. Um, my understanding is because of what's happened with MCAS, they're going to sort of reset targets for everybody. And then that's I'll be able to share at that time what our goals would be for um, for making the significant progress rating that the, the state is, or the substantial progress or the limited progress. You know, I'd be able to I tell to the school committee how much movement we'll have to make in order to get into each of those different categories. But at this time, it's unknown. They're they're refiguring right. it. Yeah, no, I guess what I'm asking, like when they provide those in the fall, is that something that you know? that you'd, you know, you'd share like, you know, NHS's target this year is and JFK's target in the four elementary schools, this is what the, the targets are. Um, and, I, and I also think, you know, as you can, we can future, you know, school committees consider budgetary things like looking at what the targets are, then maybe, you know, we would align what our budgeting is and staffing based on those targets. Yeah, I'll be happy to share them when they're published. Appreciate it, thanks. Okay, are there any other questions or comments uh, from the school committee about superintendent's uh, presentation? Okay, all right. Well, thank you again, Dr. Provost. Again, as other members have stressed, thank you for putting this together for us. Um, so that uh, that concludes the report item under our new business on this evening's uh, uh, meeting. Um, in terms of future business and meeting dates, we have our um, upcoming uh, school committee meeting with the Student Advisory Council 
uh, which is Thursday, October 14th, 2021. Uh, that student advisory council meeting begins at 6.15 and then our normal school committee meeting would begin at 6.45. The superintendent evaluation subcommittee will meet Wednesday, October 20th at 5 p.m. And then our next uh, school committee meeting would be Thursday, October 28th, uh, 2021 at 6.45 p.m. The next item on the agenda is a request for an executive session. Um, and I would entertain a motion to go into executive session. Um, um, uh, Member Goldman. Um, I, I'm happy to make the motion, uh, but before I do so, I was reviewing the um, schedule of um, committee meetings that is posted on the website, and it says that the MCAS uh, will be reviewed at the October 28th meeting, um, but instead it was, it was done today, um, and so I wonder if I believe there was a change made because of the data availability of the sure. data. Dr. Provost, did you want to just explain that? Sure. It was because getting to uh, an approved district improvement plan and metrics took some time. Principals felt they needed more time to work with their own school councils on school improvement plans. So we switched. Normally, this meeting would have been for school improvement plans, but we switched to give them more time. Okay, thank you. Annie, would you mind updating the schedule on the website if possible? Yeah, I don't mind at all. The only problem I have with that is that that schedule is voted on in the beginning of the term in January, in the beginning of the year in January. So I we might have to take a vote on that. Um, and, and so I'll update it and I'll bring it to the committee on the October 14th uh, meeting for a vote. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. I think it's fine. I mean, uh, okay. you know, I would enter, I mean, this is a ministerial function, um, our schedule. So, I mean, yeah. if someone wants to make make a motion now, <laughs> they could do it. I, All as right. far as I'm concerned, it's not really, um, setting our schedule is not really, uh, you know, it's, I would rather have the information up there sooner rather than okay. waiting the whole, you know, waiting two weeks before the meeting. Um, so, I mean, I, I really feel like we can make the change I, unless someone on the committee um, objects, um, uh, I would just say we should just make the change. It's um, to reflect reality and, and um, that would be fine. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. okay. I so have other right. questions about it, but I will just reach out to Annie directly. I don't think it's a, okay. something we all need to chat about. Okay, I would like to make a motion um, to move a uh, request to enter executive session under Massachusetts General Law Open Meeting Chapter 30A Section 21A3 to dis discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the public body and the chair so declares. Is there a second? I'll second that. Okay. Uh, this requires a, a roll call vote, like um, as all Zoom meeting motions do. Uh, mm. Member Gold. Yes. Mayor Narkowitz. Yes. Member Busansky. Yes. Member Fallon. Yes. Member Serafie Cox. Yes. Member Condon. Yes. Member Levy. Yes. And I, I'm just gonna take this opportunity to say that I, I had forgotten member Kaufman did say that he is not going to be here tonight. So he won't be with us. Um, member Goldman. Yes. And member Voss. Yes. The vote is nine in favor. Okay. so. Uh, the school committee will now move into executive session to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation, um, because to do so in open session would be detrimental to our uh, bargaining position. Uh, we will come out of executive session. Um, actually, there are a few other items on our agenda uh, that will um, have votes, uh, potential votes, um, and those are 
three memorandums of agreement uh, that are listed on the agenda. So we will go into executive session and then we will come back into open session to conduct more business in open session before ultimately adjourning. So I have to make that announcement so that members of the public know whether or not we will come back to open session. So we will. So with that, um, we will now move into executive session. And so anyone here at the meeting who does not have um, business in the executive session would need to um, leave the meeting uh, or go into a waiting room or did you arrange for a breakout room for us since we do have to come back to open session? I didn't arrange for a breakout room, but I'm happy to put one together. I think we probably should so that the open session can stay open and people who want to remain in the open session can. Um, okay, why don't I do that? I, I'm, my question is, is uh, yeah, okay, no, I don't have a question. Thanks, all too bad. So this would be um, just the school committee and Dr. Provost and uh, I don't know if Layla is joining us tonight or not. Uh, no, so not think, Layla, but Nick is here. Nick is here. Okay, right? so yeah, Nick and 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 um, Dr. Provost and the school committee. Give me a moment to put it together. Oh, the reason I don't do a a breakout room is because I can't put myself in there. How often I forget this. Um, does that mean you'd have to um, give the reins to someone else? Yeah, I want, yeah, we've done this before. Hmm. So, okay. um, I'm sorry, um, maybe uh, I- yeah, Annie, I think if you make it, you would then be able to join it if I'm not mistaken. Like you can't put yourself in it, but once it's open, you probably could step into it. Oh yeah, I think that's how, at least from my experience with Zoom, there's something well, that happens. I'll try it. I'll I'll ask Dr. Provost to take the notes for me until I get there. The only other option would be to see if we could, if you could share, you know, co-host with or Hampton Nova Media perhaps, and have them create a breakout room <laughs> to send you into. That Dave's given us the thumbs up if. Oh, um, Dave's giving us thumbs up. Okay, great. Could, Why don't I do you that? Make, that? You could make Dave co-host. He could create a breakout room, and that could, okay. you could you could be included in. I think I don't know. Dave, I'm gonna uh, make your nom account the co-host, or yeah, I'll make you co-host. Just disappeared on me. Okay. Now I'll make the breakout room. Thank you. Uh, no, I'm going to have to make Dave, I'm going to have to make you host because it won't let the host in. And I'm the host. So now I've made you host. So now I can do it. Or you'll have to do it. My apologies. Dave, can you make a breakout room? Do you need my help with that? You're muted. So, so you know. I haven't done it before, but I think I can figure it out. Um, I can walk you through it. You choose, go into breakout rooms. Yep. Then you choose manual. And then I think it says add or something. Right. And then everybody's name will come up and you choose the whole school committee plus Nick Bernier. And John Provost and Andy. And Thomas. Dr. Provost and me, thank you. Yeah. Okay, let me know if this is everybody. Ah. Well, you did it because we're all being invited to, jo to join. Is there anybody on the school committee that hasn't gotten the invite? Oh, they're disappearing, so you did it. We'll see you soon. Uh, okay. It looks like Kaya did not. Oh, um, add Kaya, can you? It's, it's uh, Kaya Goldman. Uh, Sorry, Kaya. Let me... Um, 
Okay, how do I add? I'm not sure, but I think you can go in and add somebody. Find your breakout room. I think I just did it. You got it, she got it. Okay, terrific. Thank you very much, Dave. I should have planned this better, but I'll see you soon. All right. All right.
Dave, can you hear us? We're back. Hello. Hi, we've returned to open session and we need to resume and then um, take a few votes before we adjourn. Dave, can you make me host again? There you go. Thank you. And thank you. Do you need to count us back in or are we still broadcasting? We are live now. Okay, so um, welcome back to the Thursday, September 23rd, uh, 2021 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. The school committee has just returned to open session from executive session. And we will now move to item five on our agenda, which is a uh, vote on uh, three, um, three separate MOAs. Um, and I will turn to the chair of our negotiation subcommittee to uh, make those motions. You're muted, member Sarah Peacox. You're muted. Thank you. Um, do you want them as a package or in, as individual votes? Package. I know that there was a minor change made to the staff vaccine mandate. Uh, there was a, an edit to the, uh, an incorrect year and a misspelling. Um, that was the only change made to that one. And then no changes were made to the high school meeting time MOA and the 504 coordinator MOA. Let me just double check and make sure there were no changes made to that one. Because if that's the case, then I think they could be taken as, yes, there were no changes made to that one. So um, I would move uh, all three of these MOAs, the um, 504 coordinator MOA, the high school meeting time MOA, and the staff vaccine mandate MOA with the two small uh, grammatical, uh, sorry, um, um, spelling errors and one spelling error and one date error um, that were made to the staff vaccine mandate MOA. I'll second that. Okay, so there's been a motion made and seconded to approve these three MOAs as a group. Any discussion from the school committee? Hearing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Annie, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, Member Goldman. Yes. Member Voss. Yes. Member Gold. You're muted, but I saw you. Uh, yes. Mayor Narkowitz. Yes. Member Busansky. Yes. Member Serafie Cox. Yes. Member Condon. Yes. Member Levy. Yes. The vote is eight in favor. Okay, so the motion carries and these three MOAs are uh, ratified. So uh, moving to the agenda, we have no other business this evening. So I would entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved. Is there a second? Okay, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. I'm sorry, can you tell me who the second was? Member Gold, I believe. Okay, thank you. Member Voss. Yep. Member Gold. Yes. Mayor Narkowitz. Yes. Member Busansky. Yes. Member Serafie Cox. Yes. Member Condon. Yes. Member Levy. Yes. And Member Goldman. Yes. Vote is eight in favor. Okay, so. The motion carries and the September 23rd, 2021 meeting of the Northampton School Committee is adjourned. Thank you, everyone.